Hi, greetings everybody. And as Helen said, uh, um, uh, I'm here in the town, actually in the Revillius room, building still slightly in hibernation mode, but there are noises off of uh, structures being constructed and uh, 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 walls going up in the big gallery spaces above us. So uh, hopefully won't intrude too much, but definitely signs that the exhibition is, is on its way. I'm gonna just talk through sort of four, four aspects. I wanna give you a quick thumbnail sketch about John Nash as a person, as an artist, for those of you who aren't totally familiar with him, uh, and then talk about three aspects of that triangle between his sort of artistic impulse, his mental well-being, and the landscape. Um, uh, and uh, uh, introduce some of the themes uh, of the exhibition uh, uh, that way. Uh, so John Nash, just in terms of uh, dates, he was born in 1893, died at the back end of 1977, and really from 1913 onwards he was a practicing artist, earning his living, sometimes more successfully than others. There were periods of uh, quite substantial poverty as well as relative prosperity in there uh, uh, from 1913 until, I mean, the sign that he was near the end was when he didn't attend the Royal Academy Varnishing Day in the uh, spring of 1977. And 10 years before that, um, the RA had put on a, 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 a very substantial retrospective, the largest for a living uh, artist in all the main rooms. And, uh, and this exhibition coming up will actually be his largest outing since um, then. Um, so, just a minute. Uh, and we will move <laughs> to the next slide in a minute. The first slide. Okay, there we are. And, and landscape was absolutely at the sort of fundament of his art. I mean, here is an oil painting from uh, uh, just after the First World War, at uh, the edge of the plain. He lived uh, uh, in Whiteleaf on the sort of Chiltern Estartment and then moved with his wife, Christine Kuhlenthal, down to Meadle, a hamlet two or three miles uh, out into the plain. And here is one uh, disused canal, Wormingford, much later, uh, which is actually in the Towner collection. Um, but uh, and, and again, near his home, his post-war home with um, Christine Nash, which was bottom guns uh, in the Star Valley in Constable Country, which he didn't consider a sucked orange because he 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 felt uh, there were there was much local inspiration there, and in fact. It's a feature of Nash's art that uh, fully 50% of his work across all media can be, the location of it can be found within walking distance or in the pre, pre-Second World War period, a short bike ride, or in the post-Second World War period, a, a short car ride from his two main homes, uh, and perhaps even an even larger uh, um, proportion of his best art. And landscape is sort of at the fundament of his art, whether it is in oil painting or in line drawing, who's a prolific illustrator, illustrated over 100, 100 books, uh, or in, indeed in wood engraving, very early member of the Society of Wood Engravers or the Buick Society as it was uh, when it first elected him uh, at its first meeting. Um, and also in lithography, uh, the star, uh, uh, valley here, the Stur Valley uh, uh, here, an autolithograph which was part of the contemporary lithographs uh, series uh, that was organized by Piper and Robert Wellington and Barnett Friedman and, and Harold Kerwin at the Kerwin Press in, in, in the late 30s. So landscape and it was always for him the sort of uh, the, the founding block of mu uh, much activity. And in fact, he wrote to, to um, Dora Carrington in 1915, very early on when he was sort of just emerging, uh, uh, had emerged onto the London art scene, he, she was a, a good friend, an unrequited passion of his, um, uh, uh, and he said, Hello? Have I been muted? No, How? you haven't been all the time. No. <laughs> right. uh, so he, he wrote it to Dora Carrington from Gloucester. The, ha the farmyards here are so good. I think I shall do farmyard scenes for the rest of my natural. I'm convinced now even more than formerly that a strict adherence to nature is the only thing worth doing, even at the risk of being dull. How can nature be dull? What is cubism or anything else to nature? 
So there was this sense in which uh, observation of nature rather than uh, uh, reacting to changes in, in the artistic scene itself uh, was what really preoccupied him. He was also a great comic artist, and I'll come back to the origins of that later, but this you, here I think you can see the, the, uh, an early comic drawing before he knew he really wanted to be an artist, very influenced by Edward Lear, influenced by Edward Lear because his great aunt Gussie uh, was um, an unrequited passion of Edward Lear's uh, over 20 years. And in fact, she accumulated quite a lot of Edward Lear's work in her house where John Nash as a small child would, would have seen it. It's not moving on. Sorry, we're having difficulty moving the slides on. Um, and here, here we have, and John, I said John Nash had just emerged. He really emerged onto the London art scene, almost fully fledged, untrained at an art college, when he and brother Paul had what would be called in these days, a pop-up exhibition in an upscale lampshade shop uh, near South Kensington Tube, the Dorian Lee shop. And uh, his work struck people who visited it as having enormous freshness and a lot of it sold through, from this exhibition. Um, uh, partly, I think, due, because of William Rothenstein, cultural man about town, uh, not yet the principal of the Royal College of Art, but the sort of Alan Yentob of his day, who brought along uh, a number of collectors, Edward Marsh, um, Michael Sadler, uh, the owner of the Carfax Gallery, etc., to the exhibition, uh, and who, who bought quite a bit of the work, and that gave Nash some funds for the first time. He'd been doing a sort of uh, internship on a local paper up to then. Uh, but even more importantly, Spencer Gore came along. Spencer Gore, one of the great diplomats of the quite fractious London art scene of 1913, uh, about to become the founding president of the uh, uh, um, of the, the, the London group. And he immediately got John Nash involved in exhibitions in Brighton, Leeds, uh, uh, and in Whitechapel within the next few months, get, which gave him the funds to be able to go off just before the war broke out, the cataclysm of the First World War to Italy. And he did this after he got back, but it gives a good sense of the sort of freshness and also why in a, in a way, despite all the oils, the wood engravings, which are marvelous and so on, uh, actually his landscape drawings, uh, colored and tinted landscape drawings are a, a, a real high point of, of his sort of oeuvre. I mentioned the war, this is him uh, three years later. He's just returned from 15 months um, in uh, the trenches on the bottom rungs of the British Army as a private and a corporal, a pr pretty devastating experience. And I think you can see in his demeanor, his downcast eyes, some of that. Nevinson, about the time this photograph was taken, met him at a dinner party and he said, John Nash is back. He's, he's I paraphrase here, but he's completely uh, shell-shocked and he's, he's behaving like an automaton as if he was used to dining with intellectuals every night, but he's had a terrible time in the trenches. And um, if this was uh, taken at a time of maximum insecurity for Nash, he'd been with, he'd finally got home leave after 15 months uh, on the bottom rungs of the British Expeditionary Force, uh, where he said he'd become calloused. He got used to eating his bully beef among um, uh, 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 corpses. And he was about to be appointed a war artist uh, on a six month contract. And shortly after this, because he was appointed a war artist and given an honorary commission, he was able to marry Christine Kuhlenthal, who he'd become engaged to just before getting, going off to France. And, she, and a few weeks later, moved into a disused herb shed in Buckinghamshire, where from his memory, he had to recreate his wartime experience. Brother Paul, who'd been an officer and allowed to draw and had been sent out as an official war artist with a chauffeur, a cook and a batman to tour the battlefields, had come back with 80 sketches and drawings, some of which had been on display at the Leicester Gallery. John Nash was forbidden to draw while he was in, in France. So all he had was a few notations on the side of a couple of letters that he'd sent back to Christine. And here we have 
uh, and his, his art is very much the way stations of his own military experience and the, the experience of route marches comes out from his letters. And if you compare this to, a, say, a work by Nevinson returning to the trenches where the message is these human beings fused into the machinery of war, losing their individuality, for him, this kind of fresco-like concentration, you, you get the sense of the individuals trapped in their experience, the sense of isolation between them. So very different from the Nevinson or something like Paul Nash's Men Marching at Night, which really has a message that in the darkness and confusion of war, you can't distinguish the individual from the mass. Nash's art, naive in some senses, fresco-like in others, is different. I won't go through all his war art, but three months later, he was recreating this experience, which is uh, um, a, a picture that immediately struck those who, who'd been in France when they saw it in 1919 at the big exhibition of the nation's war art as being authentic. It relates to mid-morning on the 30th of December, 1917, in Marcoing, part of the Battle of Cambrai, uh, the unit Nash was a section leader of, he'd become a corporal by then, 14 men he led that morning. Nearly all of them died in the 10 minutes after they left the, the, the trench. There are 15 figures in this painting. He added in one other person, uh, the guy in the top right quadrant, a sergeant who later died, who he knew, carrying a gun over his shoulder, uh, a, a Lewis gun. The, the kind of, when you see it in the flesh, the malevolent sort of color palette, the broiling pewter sky, the light yellow of the gas cloud on the low horizon, the gash in the earth, the, the shroud-like uh, snow-covered landscape, and these figures all either dead, bullets entering their body, about to die, facing out into no man's land, or with the top three figures on the right, uh, with a sense of resignation and fatalism, uh, sort of uh, uh, moving out probably almost inevitably towards their death. Um, it was seared on his mind. The preliminary studies are fascinating for this. He does three drawings, really worked up drawings, and they're all about just adjusting the sense of fatality in those three figures moving forward and the young man uh, looking out uh, uh, um, uh, in the foreground or, or on the right hand side. But an enormous, an act of purging almost the emotion that was involved, the shock that was involved for him there. But what is extraordinary is that while he was painting that, he was also painting this. And the background to that is that um, uh, they had uh, a rule, Paul and John, uh, Paul working on the Menin Road at the other end of the shed, um, uh, they had a rule that they had, to, because they were under contract to the Ministry of Information, they couldn't do any of their own work. But after a while, it became too much, and they decided that they would, after six in the evening, go out into the landscape and do stuff that wasn't for the Ministry. And if you go to where the herb shed was and walk about 500 yards from uh, its, uh, where, where its back door was, um, you are in this field, the Dell field. It looks, on a summer's evening, almost exactly the same, the sun streaming through the gap in the tree line. I won't go on about it, but it's a marvellous occasion and there are tales to tell about it. He was also briefly an artist in the Second World War, but interestingly appointed for six months. By three months, he wanted to stop the role. Uh, he didn't like being a spectator. His art, um, he'd begun more many things than he finished. He was attached to the Royal Navy. Um, uh, this was done at Plymouth. He and interestingly, the only painting that really comes near the intensity of what he did in the First World War uh, is this one, a dockyard fire, when he got caught by accident in a bombing raid at Swansea Docks and became involved in the firefighting. And like over the top, he did this back at Meadle after he'd uh, 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 left the docks. Um, but uh, um, so that was him as a war artist and in a sense purging his emotion and part of that to do with the landscape. And I want to talk about his childhood a, a bit. Here he is, John, with his younger sister, Barbara, about 1901. Uh, 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 
um, family background, father, not particularly successful barrister, never became a QC, was a revising barrister, which is somebody sent out to check the electoral rolls. It was the Edwardian equivalent of voter suppression to throw people off who didn't have the right pro uh, property qualification. Um, and uh, of the family finances, always strained, but particularly strained after the birth of Barbara, his younger sister, when his mother, Caroline, became quite depressive, something that then became far worse over the succeeding years. A couple of years after this photograph was taken, she attacked John with a butcher's knife, and that became the trigger event for her to really disappear into the world of nursing homes and private sanatoria. And his letters to her, and indeed from Wellington, where he went paid for by a relative for a couple of years, Wellington the school, known for its sort of sadistic culture and military enthusiasms, he wasn't particularly happy, he got into botany, but he used to, st he started his art was really doing these little cartoons to amuse, to escape on, in his uh, uh, um, letters. The other great passion for him, so again self-taught, was music. Uh, and here is he and Christine. Unfortunately, I could never find a photograph of them playing a duet together, but that is something they did nearly every day. They were together at uh, Middle in the interwar years. Um, uh, but he taught himself uh, um, uh, 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 music. And uh, the other thing, that, the area that he became totally involved in was plant life, his gardens and botany. And this is a, a hand colored illustration, probably the hand coloring done by Christine of a catalog, a nursery catalog, a hundred were done for their great friend, Clarence uh, um, Elliot at Six Hills Nursery. Luckily, we've got six of them together for the exhibition. We found six of them, so we are able to show the various um, illustrations. Um, there, yeah, but his fascination with the architecture of growing things was part of the appeal of landscape, part of him uh, or, or, or almost losing his ego in an activity uh, outside himself. And that fascination continued into his wood engraving, one of the great 20th century wood engraved books, Poisonous Plants, here are two of the images from it. If you come to the exhibition, you will go in through the town and glass doors of the main gallery and you will be walking through a blower of the deadly nightshade, but there you will see all the images inside as well. And that continued into lithography. Here's an autolithograph done um, uh, for in signature, four stones done at the Baynard Presses as an advertisement for the press in 1939. He'd begun to learn lithography in, um, uh, Helen and I will speed up. Um, uh, he'd begun to uh, learn lithography in 1936, and the day he was first trying to do work on this uh, image for contemporary lithographs, he wrote in his diary, the anniversary of the worst day of my life, I am glad to be working hard trying to forget. And the reason for that was that on the 13th of November, 1935, William, uh, their young child had been killed when he fell out of a car that Christine was driving. She collected him from nursery in the morning, taken John Nash with a painting to Aylesbury Station, was driving back home. He fell out of the car, hit his head on the curb, a curbstone and died. And they had come late to parenthood. I wouldn't say John was a natural feminist and in his approach to, to childcare, but by the time the that photo was taken in 1935, he had grown into the role and Christine was loving motherhood, having been deprived of it for a long time. And that introduced an enormous note of sadness and undertow of pain into many of their days. And it also introduced a new note into of almost melancholy into many of Nash's best landscapes. Here he is right at the end of the war, the Second World War, an early work when they went to um, live at their new house, Bottom Goms, where they lived for the for the rest of their lives. But, and there is a way in which the snow covered landscape had enormous resonance for him. I think both because it brought out the structure that he was so interested in, the sort of sprung bones between the landscape and highlighted features, but also because emotionally it related back to the two nights before Over the Top, the Battle of Marcoing. 
over the top was the, I think, uh, the, sorry, the French highway, the marching one was the first oil he did in the herb shed. Uh, this was, I think, the first thing he did in the herb shed, uh, which was a little recreation of um, those nights when he was out with three comrades in advance of the front lines before that battle in which most of those people got killed. Um, and the sort of shroud-like nature of the landscape of many, many of his snow scenes comes, I think, um, uh, from that. But interestingly, also the resilience, and I'll just show you some other winter landscapes, which you will see, you will see all these things in the exhibition if you come, uh, which just give you a sense of some of that response to landscape and particularly winter landscapes he had. Um, and I was going to talk through these at greater length, but I haven't got time, so I won't. But uh, um, uh, the, the, these are uh, a, a kind of prominent feature. But I just want to land up by contrasting Paul's worldview and, uh, uh, and John's, for Paul obviously better known. After that pop-up exhibition, um, Walter Sickert wrote a, a year later, the brothers Nashville was interesting. Paul with his head where a poet should be in the clouds and John like a child a painter should be putting his hand in his mouth to tell us what he had seen in the field or on the farm that afternoon. And he was a fantastic observer of nature. His days were spent in the landscape, observing the nooks and crannies of the landscapes in which he was able to move and visit. And we haven't talked about the wider panorama of the British landscape uh, he, he, he created. But also there was a sense in which his faith in nature as a source of sanity um, it comes out in the contrast between Paul's great wall painting, which was being created at one end of this abandoned herb shed, uh, and which he saw as, uh, he said, you know, I want to burn their lousy souls. The, the world has turned evil. This is the fifth ring of hell. Um, and, the, and I am going to bring this out in how I depict the landscape of Passchendaele and, uh, and Flanders. This, by contrast, was what John was doing as his monumental painting for the war artist scheme at the other end. He picked the time of day that was the calmest in the trenches. This is where he first went into the trenches. Yes, there is the devastation, the man-made devastation, the shells exploding on the landscape going away towards the horizon. But just look at the sky, the sense of there's some celestial music there, there you know, the, the, of a, uh, uh, maybe a, 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 um, a removed order, but a natural order that is not capable of being destroyed by uh, uh, the faults of man and, 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 and the madness of the war um, uh, below. And indeed, just flipping back to a very final comment to this one, he wrote a letter from this, from this, this uh, shell hole, his last letter to Christine um, uh, from France. Christine, who we haven't had time to talk about, but we should at some point. Um, he, wrote, he wrote the uh, letter to France and he said, uh, uh, I'm frozen, my fingers are numb. In between the sound of the machine guns, I can hear the chirping of partridges. And that, in a sense, was his faith in the natural order, his ability to get away from the troubles of his family, the tragedies in his life, sudden death crossed their lives many times that I haven't mentioned this morning, but uh, th that faith, the resilience, his sense of well-being being reinforced by able to being a, an artist observing nature, I think comes through loud and clear from what is a fascinating life story and a fascinating relationship with Christine, um, which uh, um, uh, maybe some of you will catch up with either <laughs> through the book or the exhibition, but which we haven't got time to talk about today. <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention.